I'd like to welcome you all here today to the U of L Physicians and YMCA Lunch and Learn. I'm Elizabeth Walden and I'm the Communications Manager for U of L Physicians. We're really enjoying these events that we're doing with you all, so I'm glad that you're here. We have Dr. Mejia here with us today. She's an optometrist with the U of L Physicians Eye Specialist Group, and she's going to be talking with you about living a lifetime of healthy vision. Here's Dr. Mejia. Okay, so let me know if at any point you can't hear me, um, but I've got a lot of information to share and I definitely want to leave some time to answer questions because there's usually some really good questions from um, this type of group, so I want to make sure we try to get to those as well. So the first thing we want to think about is how vision changes throughout our lifetime, and it really does change. Um, I like to use this example. This is work by Monet. Um, and in the picture um, on the right, he painted in 1899 when he was young. And this is before he developed cataracts later in life. So he painted the same scene, this water lily pond and the Japanese bridge, again in 1920, between 1923 and 1925 after he had developed cataracts. And scholars attribute this change in his perception or this change in his artwork in part to the changes that he was experiencing in his vision. And cataracts cause this yellowing kind of cloudiness of the vision. So this is the exact same scene painted about 25 years apart. Okay. So in everything that we do, um, our vision impacts how we do it. It even impacts our decisions of what we do. But the loss of vision is not something that is attributable to age. We don't lose vision as we age. Our vision changes as we age, okay? So just a real brief overview of how the eye works, okay? So this is our eye. We have light coming in from the front of the eye. That clear part is called the cornea, okay? And there are several different eye diseases that affect that part of the eye but the cornea needs to stay clear, like looking through a clear window, in order for us to get a nice sharp image. As light comes through that part, it goes through a little tiny hole, or what we call an aperture, which is the iris, that's the black part of your, or the, sorry, the pupil, that's the black part of your eye, that's surrounded by the iris, that's the colored part of your eye. And when we talk about the eye, we like to think of it as a camera. So the cornea is like that front optic on your camera. Then the pupil would be the aperture, the part that shuts and opens when you go to snap a photograph. And using that same analogy, as light goes in, this white part here in the middle is the lens of our eye. And that's what focuses the light. And that lens is where cataracts occur. So when we hear the word cataract, we're talking about this little shape right here in the inside of the eye. And we'll talk a little bit more about cataracts in just a minute here. So as light goes on in, then it has to be focused on the rest of the eye, the wallpaper on the inside of the eye, which is called the retina. And this retina, if we go back to our camera analogy, is the equivalent of the film in our camera. It's where the image lands, okay? So we've got from the cornea, through the pupil, to the lens, and back to our retina. That image is then sent to this part, that's the optic nerve. And the optic nerve is the cable that connects our eye to our brain, okay? When you have an eye exam, the doctor is examining all of these different structures. We can see all of them, all the way to the inside, all the way to the optic nerve, and make sure that things look healthy. Now there's one other part of the eye that we sometimes forget about, and that's the brain. So the image, once it goes from the optic nerve, has to be processed in the brain. And if you think about, again, going to our camera analogy, this is the photo lab at Walmart that develops those pictures for us, okay? So we've got to make those meaning and be able to do something with it, and that happens in the brain. So anything that affects the brain, but particularly strokes, okay, or injuries such as a car accident, 
can also affect our vision if it affects this part of the brain. And what we're looking at is usually the back part of the brain is where most of our vision is. We have muscles in the eyes that control the movement. So the movement of our eyes up and down and side to side is controlled by six muscles. And so we look at those as we examine the eye as well. So everyone's vision changes as we get older. That's normal, OK? Difficulty seeing clearly, particularly up close, is usually the first thing that we'll experience, the first change that we'll experience. Show of hands. Anybody have trouble seeing things up close? Need your bifocals? Right? Yes. <laughs> OK. So this starts to develop between 41 and 60, OK? Um, it's very predictable. It happens to everybody. It is not a sign that there's anything wrong with the visual system, but it's part of the normal aging process. Okay? However, these changes get you into the eye doctor's office usually, so we can start looking for other things that do happen, okay, that can affect the vision. So some of the other common vision changes, not vision losses, but vision changes that happen, is losing the ability to focus. And we talked about the lens of the eye, that happens there. The lens can't move, it can't flex and bend like it does when we're in our 20s and 30s. And so we use the ability to focus up close. For some folks that also means the ability to focus in the distance, all right? Declining sensitivity, anybody have trouble seeing at night? Yeah. So declining sensitivity, particularly in low light situations, also happens. Again, that's usually because of those cataracts, but it's also due to changes in the size of our pupil. Needing more light to read. Anybody kind of need a reading light on or go outside on the porch to read the newspaper because it's easier? Those are normal changes. And dryness. Anybody suffer from dryness of the eyes? Very common, okay? More common in women, more common in diabetics. So if you have diabetes, your eyes may be drier. Lots of medications cause dryness of the eyes. So if you're on medications, there's a good chance that at least one of them is gonna cause some dryness of the eyes. So these are normal things that we see and can manage. And a lot of times we can correct these. So the trouble focusing, we can correct with bifocals or reading glasses, okay? Changes in light sensitivity we can correct with filters or tinted glasses, maybe a special pair of sunglasses. Dryness of the eye, we can use lubricating eye drops or artificial tears, or we can even prescribe medications to manage dry eye. So those are things that we can change. We can also talk to you about changing the lighting. Sometimes we need to get a new light bulb. We need to move where the light is. But those things actually make a big difference on our vision. So adults over 40 um, are at risk for more serious eye problems or eye diseases, okay? This is particularly true if you have any chronic conditions such as diabetes or high blood pressure. If you have a family history, mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, brother, sister, that has glaucoma, macular degeneration, or a history of retinal detachment. Other health conditions like high cholesterol, thyroid disease, so a hyperthyroid or a hypothyroid, depression, all right? All of these can also cause you to have a higher risk of eye-related diseases. And then as I said before, many medications uh, diuretics for blood pressure, depression medications, even your allergy medication, that over-the-counter Claritin or Zyrtec that you take during allergy season, they all have side effects that affect the eyes, okay? Now something simple like our Claritin is usually just going to dry the eyes out, but some of them have more serious side effects. Uh, so uh, a lot of our rheumatoid arthritis medications, if you have rheumatoid arthritis, have very serious eye side effects that we need to monitor, okay? But I cannot stress again, losing vision is not a normal part of aging. However, age does increase the risk for these conditions. 
Many of these diseases have no warning signs or symptoms. Okay? They don't affect how well you see until the later stages of the disease. So it's important that we monitor for these conditions and catch them early so that we can provide treatment when it's available. Everyone over 50 and, old, or 50 and older should have a comprehensive dilated eye exam once a year. So just for, out of curiosity, who here has had an eye exam within the last year? All right. So those of you that didn't raise your hand know we got to do this afternoon, right? Go call and make an appointment. So here's why. Here's what we're looking for, okay? In a 50 and older population, these are the things that you may not know you have that we want to find out, okay? The first one is age-related macular degeneration. This is a condition that affects our central vision. So the picture on the right is normal vision. The picture on the left is macular degeneration. This can cause, yes ma'am? But isn't that usually just when the macula has been the, that center part, but it can it just deteriorate around and you still would have vision? Or is it usually always just focused on the macula? The macular degeneration is always in the center. Now it can start out so that it's just a little distorted or blurry there. But macular degeneration always affects our central vision. It only affects the macula. Okay, the macula is what we use to see to read. It's what we see to look at faces, okay? So macular degeneration can be silent. You may notice some waviness or distortion. So if you're looking at a telephone pole and it looks a little wiggly, okay, that's a sign of macular degeneration. It can just be as subtle as just blurring of your vision and we can't correct it with glasses. All right, that's macular degeneration. There are treatments available. There is not a cure, but there are treatments that are available. Okay. Cataracts, we've said this one a lot because this is a big one. This happens to everybody. Everybody gets cataracts. Just depends on how old you are when you get them and how much they affect you. Okay. But a cataract is a change in the lens of the eye. That nice crystal clear window or crystal clear lens that we have when we're young gets gray or yellow and cloudy. So if you imagine a window that you couldn't reach and you've never cleaned in your home, pretty tough to see the neighbor's house through it, right? That's a cataract. Now fortunately, we can fix cataracts. So in our country, rarely does ever, anybody ever suffer uh, from blindness or disability due to a cataract because the procedure, which is covered by Medicare, um, can fix it, okay? It's an outpatient surgery. It's done in a matter of minutes. I had a patient the other day told me he'd rather get a cataract taken out than go to the dentist. So, um, so we can fix these, but we need to know about them. We need to monitor them, okay? The next big one, diabetic retinopathy. Diabetic eye disease is the leading cause of blindness in our country. Leading cause of new cases of blindness is diabetes. Very rarely does it have any warning signs or symptoms, okay? If your blood sugar is not controlled, then it is possible that we have changes on the blood vessels on the inside of the eye that could potentially lead to a sight-threatening disease. We can treat this, we can manage it, there is no cure for it, uh, but keeping your blood sugar under control is the most important part. Diabetic disease causes these little tiny blind spots that pop up throughout the vision, okay? And unlike macular degeneration, it's not just in the center, it can be throughout the visual field. It also causes decreased in contrast, so being able to tell light from dark, to recognize faces, Okay. It can cause a loss of peripheral vision. So all of these different things can be affected by diabetes. Okay. Even your glasses prescription can be affected by diabetes. So if your sugar is running very high, you may have a day where your glasses just aren't working very well. And then the next day it's okay. Or you go into the doctor and your sugar is really high and we measure you for glasses and the next week they don't work anymore. Okay, diabetes has lots of effects. 
glaucoma is probably um, one of the trickiest for me, and that's because this really is a silent condition. Glaucoma is a condition that affects the optic nerve. So remember I mentioned that cable that connects the eye to the brain. This is the part of the eye that it affects. And it is most cases caused by an increase in the pressure in the eye. The eye is a round ball that has a fluid pressure inside. If that pressure gets too high, then it can cause damage to that nerve, okay? That pressure doesn't feel like anything to you, okay? It's not even, and it's not related to your blood pressure necessarily. So that pressure being eye, we have to measure that in the eye exam to make sure that your pressure is okay, all right? But glaucoma, unlike these other diseases, causes a loss from the outside in. This causes tunnel vision. So if you hold your hands up and you know, look like you're looking through just a little tunnel here, this is what glaucoma looks like. So it affects your peripheral vision. Okay. We, again, have no cure for glaucoma, but we have treatments. And treatment for glaucoma can be as simple as an eye drop that you take before you go to bed every night. Okay. There are also surgeries that are available, but we can manage glaucoma. No one should go blind from glaucoma if we're getting regular eye exams, but it happens, okay? Mostly in patients that are not getting routine eye exams. Is that, okay. is that a drop? Glaucoma, a drop? The first line of treatment is an eye drop, uh-huh. Yeah, and the other thing I add to the list of common things is stroke, because this is what I do particularly. I work with stroke patients and brain injury patients Stroke can also affect our vision. And the most common thing that a stroke causes is loss of one side of your vision. Okay, not one eye, one side. So after a stroke, I could be standing in this room, see everybody to my left okay, but not see anybody to the right unless I turned my head and looked at them. Okay, so we see visual field loss in stroke patients very, very often. Now, a stroke affects the brain, and if you remember I said earlier that the brain is where all this is processed, so that can be something we have to look for too, is maybe it's difficult to recognize words or to recognize faces. That's vision. The eyeball itself may be fine, but we need to look at the brain, okay? And there are training and rehabilitation programs available to help with those kinds of changes after a stroke. All right. Low vision is uh, what I actually do in the clinic. Um, so I'm a low vision specialist. I work with patients that have been affected by any of these diseases, glaucoma, macular degeneration, strokes. And low vision is when you have a disease, something that has affected your vision, and it really impacts your ability to read the mail, drive your car, watch TV. And my job is to help you do those things again. Okay, and we do that by using special eyeglasses, magnifying lenses, so a magnifier, uh, computers, technology, and then I also work with an occupational therapist that helps us learn how to do things a little bit differently. Okay, maybe we need to organize our cupboards a little bit differently. Maybe we need to put dots or bumps on the remote control so we can see the numbers a little bit better, or the telephone. Okay. So my job is to make it that whatever visual impairment you have, for whatever reason, does not affect your ability to be independent, to do your day-to-day -day things, to come out to the Y and have lunch with your friends. Okay? My job is to make those things still happen. Okay? Uh, so we talked about this. Uh, so how do you protect your vision? Well, like I said, and I can't stress enough, the most important thing is that you're getting an eye exam every year. For younger folks, we sometimes say two years, but over the age of 50, every single year. And for those of you that have grandchildren and maybe great-grandchildren, our little ones should be getting an eye exam by their first birthday, their first eye exam. And then between the ages of three and five, and then every year that they're in school. Okay. And what is a, cool, a complete eye exam? Well, we're going to measure you for glasses, but we don't stop there. Okay. We're going to make sure your peripheral vision is good. We're going to look for those signs of tunnel vision or glaucoma changes. We're going to look at how the eye muscles are working. And then we're going to look at all those structures that I pointed out at the beginning. And to do that, we need to put drops in your eyes. 
Don't come in and tell us you don't want the drops. We need the drops. <laughs> the drops let us look on the inside of the eye. Okay? Can't see it without. It's like looking through a keyhole instead of opening the door. All right? So that's how we're able to look at all those structures and make sure that there's nothing else we need to talk about. It doesn't hurt. The drops do last about two or three hours and make you real sensitive to the sunlight, but it wears off. We give you sunglasses to wear home, okay? Sure, so, sure. so the question was there are new machines, the OptiMap, things that can take a picture. Those are good, um, and they're good. <laughs> I still think, in my personal professional opinion, nothing beats letting a trained doctor look in the eye yourself and see it in 3D. The pictures give us a flat image. I can't see if anything's lifted up. So there are tumors that grow in the eye. There are blood vessels that swerve and squiggle, and we lose some of that when we take a photograph. So maybe we do a picture every other year, and the years in between, we actually put the drops in. But it's my opinion that we, nothing substitutes for the drops and me actually looking at that eye, okay? How else do we protect our vision? Stop smoking, okay? And tell everybody that you live with to stop smoking. So I had this conversation with a patient yesterday. She, she wasn't a smoker. I smelled smoke in the room, though. Somebody was a smoker. Uh, and sure enough, her husband was still a smoker. So that secondhand is, smoke is equally... Um, risky, she had macular degeneration. Macular degeneration, the number one leading risk factor for progression of the disease is smoking. So smoking affects all of these different diseases. Smokers develop cataracts more quickly. Smokers have a harder time controlling their diabetes. So smoking's no good. I'll stop there with the smoking lecture. Yes, ma'am. There, there, the question was, how does smoking affect it? Um, there's a lot of different reasons. The nicotine is damaging, but the, the smokes, the things that are in cigarettes are damaging. It does affect immunity. All of those things are, are, are toxic. So you guys are enjoying an excellent lunch today, although we're missing a few colors. Um, we like to see some green leafy vegetables, okay? Orange, everybody knows carrots are good for the eyes, right? Carrots are full of beta carotene, but any orange vegetable is also that. So it's pumpkin season, pumpkin, squash, uh, your zucchinis, all of those green, yellow, red vegetables are actually really, really essential nu nutrients to eye health, okay? Fresh fish is also important. Here in Kentucky, maybe we're not getting a lot of that in our diet. Um, so supplements like omega-3 fatty acids or fish oil supplements um, are very good for eye health, so you can talk to your eye doctor about what supplements you should be taking. Um, there's new research and new studies that um, our doctors at UofL um, and the eye specialists are really at the forefront of doing that looks at your body and what vitamins and nutrients you need, okay? So the little bottles of eye vitamins that are on the shelf are actually, we're learning, are not good for everybody you may need a specific formulation of that vitamin based on your genes. And so they can do a test with a little swab and find out what vitamins you should be taking. Okay. Be physically active. I can't think of a better place to be to stress this, but getting active, being out there and exercising is a, is a really important part of eye health. Along with that is controlling your blood pressure, your cholesterol, and your weight. Okay, your body mass index. And then if you have diabetes, we have to work really hard to keep that under good control. Okay. Wear sunglasses with a brimmed hat. We need to protect our eyes from UV protection, and that's throughout the year. So that's pretty easy to do in the summertime. We think about it. We'll grab our cap and our sunglasses. But in the winter months, we still get that sun. We get a lot of glare from that snow if we get any. So wearing a hat and sunglasses. Wearing protective eyewear, I don't want to skip over that one. Wearing protective eyewear, if you're out mowing the grass, okay, or you're using a garbage disposal, I'm going to check my time here. Uh, uh, you're using a garbage disposal. Anything that has a rotary motor can fling stuff up and potentially threaten your eye, okay? So if you're out mowing the yard, bless my husband's poor heart, I have made him wear safety glasses every time he's mowed the lawn since we were together. 
Um, he used to complain about it, but he's given up. So safety glasses, um, anything like a weed whacker, lawn mowers can be very dangerous. Okay. Fall prevention. Um, so I'm on a committee here in Kentucky for the Kentucky Safe Aging Coalition, and one of the things we have talked about a lot is fall prevention. So uh, just some tips to think about. First of all, you need to wear proper glasses inside and out, okay? So that means sunglasses when you're outside, clear lenses or special filtered lenses when you're inside and making sure we have the right ones. Some folks need a separate pair of glasses for walking around and another pair of glasses for sitting down to read the Bible, okay? We need to make sure that you have the proper eyewear. Sometimes, particularly when we have these eye diseases, we need to mark our stairs and our railings. So if you've ever seen stairs in a public place that have the yellow on them, that's a contrast mark to make it stand out. And so my occupational therapist and I will go out to homes and we'll make those markings in places that for folks that need it. Making sure that you have good illumination in your home, okay? Night lights in the hallways along low-lying areas, okay? Flashlight handy in case the power goes out. You know, like last night we had our storm, so my husband was going around gathering flashlights and putting them next to the kids' beds. Uh, we need to have lighting so we can get around comfortably. And then wearing proper footwear, okay? If you have any kind of arthritis, knee problems, hip problems, or mobility issues, then we need to make sure you're wearing the proper shoes. It's not just vision, but all of those things can affect you, okay? All right. So you need to make your vision one of your health priorities, okay? So we go to the doctor, we get our checkups, everybody gets their blood pressure checked every now and then, we need to check our vision too, okay? And that's more than just reading letters on a chart. We wanna make sure that we're looking on the inside of the eye, we're checking the pressure in the eye, we're looking at those muscle movements and make sure everything looks good, okay? So once a year eye exams. And then remember that some changes are normal but other changes can be the sign of an eye disease, okay? So it's not enough to say, well, I can't see as well now because I'm older, and my eyes are just getting older. It may be that you have the beginning stages of macular degeneration, or it may be that you have a cataract, and these are things that we can treat and manage, okay? Okay, so the question was, after cataract surgery, one eye is good and one eye is maybe not so good, and the two eyes together maybe not working as well. Well, two things. One, when we do surgery, we change how the eye works. We change the power of the eye. Uh, now, do you wear glasses? Okay, is it the same with the glasses on and off? Yeah. Sometimes there is a misalignment of the eyes. The best advice is yeah, sometimes these things happen and we need to figure out a way to make it a little bit more tolerable. So if the doctor you're going to is not answering the question for you, go get another one. Yeah, go talk to somebody else, okay? Because somebody may have a different answer. So we got to look for another solution. I, I, I've already got this uh, told to call this doctor right here. <laughs> He's good, he's very good. All right, Other, he's very good. Other questions I can answer about our vision? Any of the eye diseases that we talked about? How common is dry eye around you Valley? The question was how common is dry eye in the Ohio Valley? No more, from any research I've seen, no more than anywhere else around the, the, around the country. Allergies are a big part of it though. We have a lot of allergies, uh, in part because just of the, the trees and, and, and our environment, but because of the pollution, uh, particularly in the Louisville metro area, we have a high level of pollution and that very significantly contributes to dry eye um, and allergies. Use so. drops a couple of times a day and you solve my problem. Right, so he says using drops a couple of times a day takes care of it and that's right on. That means you're using the right drop, you're doing the right things. If, if your dry eye is not responding, you're putting drops in all the time and it's not getting any better, well, either one, you're not using the right kind of eye drop. So 
So throw away those bottles of Visine or Clear Eyes. That's not going to solve the problem. Um, and number sustain's good. Another reason is we may not be treating the right problem. So if you're not getting response to the eye drops, we need to go back in and find out maybe there's something else going on and it's not just, you know, environmental dry eye. Sustain is good. Is it good? Yeah. <laughs> Other questions? Yes, ma'am. Okay, I'm going to start with reading glasses. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. So the question was, I'm just starting to need to wear reading glasses. If I don't put them on and kind of strain to see, am I hurting my eyes? And the question is absolutely not. You're not doing any harm by not wearing them. You're going to give yourself a headache. <laughs> Maybe make yourself a little tired, you know, get more sleepy when you're reading. So you're making it tougher on you, but you're not causing any physical harm. And the opposite is also true. So you're not causing any damage by wearing glasses. You're not making the condition worse or weakening your eyes by wearing glasses. Doesn't happen, okay? So the only thing you're doing by not wearing your glasses is just making it harder for yourself. Wearing the glasses, reading glasses are magnifiers. They're gonna make the image bigger and make the task easier for you to do, okay? And so for those of you, you put your glasses on and you can see and then you take them off and you can't see anymore. Well, it's not because the glasses did any harm. It's because your brain figured out, well, man, this was a lot easier when I put the glasses on. This is what I was missing. So we can do that better. So no harm by not wearing them. You're just making life a little bit tougher, but not doing any damage to wear them either. Excuse me. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, we'll take one or two more, and then I know you guys got to get, we got to get to your raffle pri or your door prizes. Yes, ma'am. Great. The question was, what are the symptoms of computer vision syndrome? So. I love to hear that, particularly in, in my senior talks, because I love to see people using computers. Uh, don't be afraid of them. Um, computer vision syndrome is defined as dryness, and dryness more specifically is the burning of the eyes, itching, watering is actually a sign of dryness, okay? That irritation feeling like you've got something in your eye, that sandy, gritty feeling, all of those are dryness symptoms. Um, Computer vision sy syndrome is also that sleepiness, kind of feeling really tired at the computer, feeling like your eyes are heavy. Um, it can also include headaches, more specifically headaches that are kind of in your neck and your shoulders, but also this kind of right in front of the brow headache. Um, those, that's all computer vision. And we can treat that, number one, by having the right glasses, okay? So the glasses that you read a book with in your lap may not be the same glasses that you need to see the computer at your arm's length, okay? So, one second. So we need proper glasses for the computer. We also have a tendency to stare when we're at a computer. We don't blink our eyes anymore. We've actually done studies where we put cameras on top of people's monitors, and they just do this. And so, put a post-it note on your monitor that says blink. Okay, remind yourself to blink. Take a break. Um, and then making sure your computer is set up properly. So if our computer is too low down or too high up and we're craning our neck, or we don't have our feet on the ground in the chair that we're sitting in, all of those things can lead to visual fatigue and inability to do what you want to do when you're at, sitting down at the computer. And did you have a follow-up question? I'm old enough to know when the computers came in, and they had a basic dark green screen with white lettering. Then we changed to the light blue background. But does that help? Not necessarily. I, and I, I don't know any of the scientific research to back that up. Um, there is a lot of glare from the screen, and the newer screens have kind of, we've gotten more glare, although as we've gone to flat panels, we've decreased some of the glare. So the biggest issue was glare. And when we were doing the black and the green, that was not great contrast. And we do the light blue, it wasn't really good contrast, so that was difficult for folks to see. But now with computers, we can adjust all that color to make it what looks what works for us. And that's really what's most beneficial is to be able to adjust it for how your eyes are seeing at that time. So, okay, I'll take one more question from the back. Why does some part of the eyes have more covered by insurance and others not? That's another really good question. The question was, why are some parts of the eye exam covered by insurance and others are not? Uh, so the eye exam itself, the part where we are 
dilating the eyes and looking inside is usually covered under your insurance. Medicare covers a routine eye examination, okay? Um, don't go in and tell the doctor, I'm just here for a routine eye exam, though, okay? Because insurance doesn't like to cover it if you just go in and say, I'm just here because I felt like it. <laughs> or because Dr. Mejia told me I should come in, okay? Insurance companies like to pay for things when there's something wrong that you want us to fix. So you gotta come in and tell me, I can't see, doc. My eyes are dry. Mom had glaucoma, I wanna know, do I? Don't come in and say there's nothing wrong, okay? That's the number one reason why things don't get covered. The number two thing that they don't cover is the refraction. And that's the part where we bring that big machine in front of you and spin those dials and say which is better, number one or number two. Insurance companies have determined for whatever reason, and I don't know, that that is not medically necessary. The same reason why they don't cover your glasses. Because they say that glasses are not medically necessary. You're not gonna die if you don't wear your glasses. I can make arguments that that's not really true because I wouldn't have been able to drive here today if I wasn't wearing my contact lenses. So insurance, for whatever reason, does not pay for the refraction, the same reason they don't pay for glasses. They don't consider them to be medically necessary. But we have to do it, because I can't make you see better unless I give you lenses. So that's the tricky part. But the examination itself is usually a covered part of any kind of health care, including your Medicare coverage. Just come in for a reason. Tell us there's something wrong.